our first call is from Norfolk, Virginia. Okay, Norfolk, what's your question? Okay, um, some people say that shorebirds have an internal magnet to help them migrate. Is this true, and if it's not, how do they know when and where to fly? Okay, good question, good question. The question was, some people say that shorebirds have an internal magnet or maybe even like a compass that helps them migrate. The question was, is that true, and uh, how does it work for them? I think we should uh, pitch that to Alaska and see if our Alaskan friends could answer that. Excellent question. You know, the shorebirds are kind of interesting because up on the breeding grounds, that's one of, they're one of the few species or actually bird groups where the adults will migrate out before the young. So it is instinctual. But it's not just a magnet. They use a lot of things. They're looking at the stars and the map. You know, they kind of have a map in their head, just like you do when you're driving in your car and you're holding the map while your mom or dad's driving. Great. Great. That's a great answer, yeah, Dan. Thank super, you very much. Super. You know, our next question is going to be from Mrs. Poppy's class. How long is the life of a shorebird? Great. So how long is the life of a shorebird? Dan? Bell, can you tell us? Out. I can answer that question. Shorebirds live about four or five years, but there's been some reports of some even living to 14. Oh, so it really varies. Thank you. Wow, Thanks. Some of those That's can live great. A long time. Oh, super. Okay. Our next uh, question is from Gerard Middle uh, School in Illinois. Okay, Gerard Middle School, what's your question? What would the birds do if there was a storm? Oh, good question. The question is, what would the birds do if there was a storm? Now, I know the folks in Cordova can help us with that. Definitely. Let's go yeah. to find out. Uh, well, that, that's, that's a good question, too, because if it's storm, the birds are just going to be doing just like what you would do if there was a storm. They're going to hide, and they're going to stick close to shore where they can, um, you know, eat and also and hang out. And, in fact, here in Cordova, um, we don't think we've seen as many shorebirds this year here in Hartney Bay is because it's been such great weather that they're all going out uh, past Egg Island and in the islands of the Sound. But uh, if, uh, if, uh, if it's really bad weather, that's when you see the huge clouds of shorebirds here because they hang out in Hartney Bay until the weather clears, and then you get millions and millions flying up in the sky. So anyway, that's the difference between good and bad weather. Boy, I remember those big storms in Cordova. Oh, wow, okay. I can't imagine. And we have another cl uh, question from Mrs. Poppy's students. How much does a shorebird weigh? So how much does a shorebird weigh? Great question. Another good one. <laughs> um, the shorebirds weigh about 25 grams. They're not very heavy. You hold one in your hand, you'd be surprised at how light they are. That's about the, about the weight of a quarter. Six quarters, actually. Six quarters. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So those little westerns are, are pretty small. OK, we have our next call from Windsor, Virginia. Windsor, what's your question? When, I mean, do we have the birds that y'all are talking about in the eastern states? Oh, good question. Do we have the birds, the little western sandpipers that we're talking about right here? Let's, we're going to answer that one here. Sure, okay. sure. We sure do have a number of uh, shorebirds that are actually migrating through right now. And then we have a number of shorebirds that, that are here all year. In fact, you may have heard of the killdeer. That's a very popular bird you might even see in your schoolyard. And, and the great way to see if, uh, know if you've got a killdeer is when you hear birds fly. And if it says, killdeer, killdeer, then you probably have a killdeer in your area. So yes, we have shorebirds on the East Coast. Great. Thanks, Hillary. Okay, we, now we have a call from Missoula, Montana. Missoula, what's your question? If, can, why do they need to eat so much if they couldn't get any on the way? Couldn't they get food on the way? Okay, the question is, can they get food along the way, and can, why do they have to eat so much? Okay, let's go to Cordova, Alaska, and see if they can answer that let's for see us. That. Sure. Those birds stop at several places they'll stop. You know, they come up the Pacific Coast, they're going to stop in San Francisco Bay and then around Seattle and then Canada. And when they stop, they eat a tremendous amount of food. 
It'd be kind of like if you were getting ready to, to leave San Diego or where's, I'm not sure where this call was from, but say you left the West Coast, you left San Diego, went up to San Francisco. It'd be like you running up there all in a couple days and then stopping and you'd have to eat probably 50 pounds of peanut butter to run the rest of the way. And one, one reason that this delta is so important is if you look on a map or if you fly in a plane from uh, the West Coast, the whole time you're just going to see mountains and glaciers. So there aren't any mud flats until you get to the Copper River Delta for birds to eat. So this delta is really important. It's really a critical habitat they for can, the birds. They can double their weight here. That's yeah, double important. their weight. Double their weight. It's real good form. And we figured out in our activities, I don't know if anybody did the activities, but uh, to for an 80 pound student to eat <laughs> uh, a McDonald's hamburger every 10 minutes, uh, it, they would take them 2,016 hamburgers to uh, double their weight. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. I don't think I could eat that many. Okay, now we have an email question. So, Ron, can you handle that? Yeah, this question is from Wellington Junior High School in Wellington, Colorado. And the question is this. Are there any shorebirds that migrate east and west in addition to north and south? Mm. Ooh. Good, Good one for question. Dan. Should yeah. we send it back oh, to yeah. Alaska? Okay, <laughs> Dan, help us out here. I'll do it. Yeah. No, there isn't. All these shorebirds here in the Western Hemisphere, they're all north-south migrators. There's not any of these birds that migrate east to west. They'll sometimes move a little bit east to west on their flight, but they're staying within their flyways, either the Pacific Flyway or all the way over in the Atlantic and then the flyways in between. I think the Hawaiian birds that migrate up here yeah. are even moving directly north yeah. to the, Alaska, not too far to the east. Yeah, the, the Pacific Golden Plover would be the closest one that's kind of going to north-south. It's coming from Hawaii to Alaska. But that's still a, a, called a north-south migration. Great, super. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Okay, we have a caller from Missoula, Montana. Missoula, what's your question? Are you there, Missoula? Okay. <laughs> no. Are you there, Missoula? Hello? Yes. All right. I'm from Manassas, your... Virginia. Okay, Manassas. Okay. Go ahead, Manassas. Okay. I would like to know how many um, migrations a shorebird makes in one lifetime. How many times does the shorebird migrate in a lifetime? Mm. Wow, that's a great question. And I think our friends in Cordova can help yeah, us out with that one, too. Yeah, I think so, too. too. Let's All see. Right. Okay. Somebody, you want that one? You sure. Can kind of a multiplication problem. It's if they, they migrate north and then they migrate south, and as Pam told us, that if they migrate five times, they live five years, then that would be ten times, and some of them, if they can get to 14 times, we're going to get 28 migrations out of them. That's if you count the trip up and the trip south as separate trips. And I think those birds kind of count those as separate trips. Long flights. 7,000 miles. A, that's a lot of miles. That, that, that is. is. And the cool thing that Dan was telling us just before the show started was that some of these shorebirds actually, <laughs> uh, the young ones, make that trip with, without uh, the adults along. They come later than the, than the adults. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely something that's in their brains. <laughs> Well, you guys are doing great yeah. with your questions. These are yeah. just wonderful. Okay, our next call is from Seymour, Connecticut. Seymour, what's your question? If birds eat a lot before uh, they migrate, do they get cramps and stomach aches? Ooh, oh, great good question. question. <laughs> kind of like we do before yeah. soccer or something and eat too much. Good okay, question. Okay, the question is if birds eat so much as they're migrating, do they get cramps and stomach aches? Kind of like we do. Okay, I think that's a Cordova question. Yeah, yeah. Let's find out. <laughs> Boy, I sure would get a stomach ache if I ate that much for those favorite shorebird munchies. But shorebirds are adapted to eat that much. We can't eat a huge barrel of peanut butter and then run a couple of marathons. But shorebirds can put on that body fat very easily because they're adapted for those long migrations. Great. That's fascinating. We, we now have a, a question from a student in Mrs. Poppy's class. Are, are the birds the same color? Are the birds the same color? I think we can do that right here. There's actually a, a variety of species of shorebirds, and they're all different colors. But the one thing they have in, column, in common is that their, their plumage is all generally colors that help them blend in to their habitat. So they're going to be 
browns and oranges and, and beiges and so forth. And then there's some uh, birds that are exceptionally colorful and they'll have some red on them and, uh, and some of them have bright pink legs. So there is a lot of variation. They're, they're really fascinating. And what I'd recommend is you pick up a, um, go to your, your uh, library, your student library at your school and um, look at a bird identification guide and go to the shorebird section and just take a peek at all the different shorebirds there are that, that uh, migrate through this area. It's really fascinating. Great, yeah. Hillary. Shorebirds can be kind of subtle, but they sure are beautiful. They are. They're beautiful. Okay, our next question is an email question. So, Ron, what's our question? This question comes from North, North Fork Academy, North Fork, Virginia, and the question is, do most flocks live through their migration journey? Oh, good, good. question. Do yeah. most flocks, yeah. most birds, live, make it through that migration journey? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to Cordova. Yeah. They can answer that for us. Yeah, I, I can't remember the exact figure on how many birds make it. Uh, a good number of them do. You know, when we look at our staging area here, most of these birds that stop here migrate out. I, I would guess that probably say within the birds here, maybe a little over 90% survive and make it up to the wintering ground. That's kind of a guess. I'd have to look that up. Super, Dan. Thank you. And now we have a caller from Topeka, Kansas. Topeka, what's your, your question? Can shorebirds go to one place and then go back to Alaska and come back to the next same place in spring? Okay, when shorebirds migrate and they go to Alaska, are they going back and forth to the same place? I think that's a good, another good question for Dan. We want to go to Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> I think those birds do generally head back to the same areas. There might be some, some birds that stray off with another flock and end up someplace different than they started, but generally they are pretty well imprinted with where they want to go home to and where they want to summer. They like those areas quite a bit. That's great. You, you folks are just doing a great job with your questions. Yeah. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. You haven't stumped us yet. Okay, our next question is from Mrs. Poppy's class. What's your question? Is there such thing as an eastern sandpiper? Oh, great question. I don't know. Do you want to handle that, Hillary, or sure. should we go to Alaska? No, uh, okay. We actually don't have a shorebird called the eastern sandpiper. So there are some other species that look similar to a western sandpiper, but we don't have any named eastern sandpiper. But excellent question. That's great. Wow, these are great. Yeah. Okay, our next, our next question is from Benton Middle School in Prince William County. So right here and where we're broadcasting from the studio today. Okay, what's your question? How long was the longest distance a shorebird has ever traveled? Ooh, how long is the longest distance a shorebird has ever traveled? Wow. I think that's a great Alaska question. Yeah. Let's go see what they have to say. Red knots travel 14,000 miles. That's a long ways. They come way up to Alaska from, is it New Zealand? What? Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> That's it from Alaska. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we now have a call from Mesquite, Texas. Mesquite, Texas, what's your question? Hello, Mesquite. Um, do their, does the parents stay with the babies after they're born? Good question for them. Okay, do the parents stay with the chicks after they're born? Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's ask the shorebird experts in Cordova. <laughs> Well, uh, yes, uh, one parent at least stays with the chicks after they're born. Uh, as in most, in shorebirds, in fact, it's a little different because there's quite a number of shorebirds where it's the dad that stays with the, the chicks after they're born instead of the mother. So, uh, but it, it varies depending on the species. Okay, great, great. Okay, we're going to go to Mrs. Poppy's class for one of their questions. What coastal states do shorebirds live in? Ooh, what coastal states do shorebirds live in? Wow. Should we go to Alaska? Well, yeah. Okay, let's, do let's that. see if Dan and the okay. crew can help us out. Well, the coastal states that they live in, of course, is Alaska, and this is where they nest. And then they'll migrate all the way down the Pacific coast. So they'll live and they'll stop for a short time in Washington. And some birds, like a killdeer, they'll nest down in Washington. Then they'll go through Oregon, Oregon, Calif yep. California. Oregon, California, and then Mexico. 
All right, and on the Atlantic fly, we, ha we have a number of shorebirds like the piping plover that will nest um, in uh, Virginia, North Carolina, on up to New Jersey. A number of shorebirds will um, spend the winter along the Texas coast. And, um, and so we do have a number of species that are also in the coastal states of the United States. Okay, I guess we have an email question, Ron. Question comes from Mrs. Pollitt's sixth grade science class from Girard, Illinois. The question is, why do shorebirds' feathers change color? Ooh. Oh, good question. Yeah, great. I think, I think our experts in, in Alaska can, can help, help us. us with that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, the reason is, is that it attracts their mate. They uh, are able to identify the right species that they're supposed to be with that way. And also, they like those feathers, the birds do. So they kind of see it as a way of dressing up wearing makeup or just generally looking good. <laughs> and, and a lot of migratory birds, you know, when you think about how far they travel, they beat up their feathers pretty good. So if you look at shorebirds and waterfowl and a lot of other birds, they'll replace their feathers once a year, spring and fall, both times. And that helps them keep their feathers in good shape so they can make those migrations. Great. Great. Fabulous. That's a great answer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, our next call is from Richmond, Richmond Virginia. Richmond, do you have your question? What's your question? Um, how many how many food does a bird eat before they migrate? Oh, good question. Mm -hmm. How much food does a bird eat before it migrates? You know, the Cordova folks spent a lot of time looking at those mud meals. That's right. Let's go back to that yeah. and see if Bell maybe could help us out. Yeah. Bell or whoever. Go ahead, Bell. Well, I don't know. I guess we know how many hamburgers a bird would eat in <laughs> 2016, but I don't know. But you can imagine it must be a pile, huge pile. Well, if you want, go ahead. If you watched a couple of birds and you watched that sewing machine motion with their bills, if they could pick up one critter with each of those probes in the mud, they would be pretty full, and that would be a lot to eat. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's a project that some of these people watching the show would want to take on as they. Yeah, for a that's pretty amazing to think year. about. We now have yeah, a call from idea. Montana, Missoula. Montana, Missoula, what's your question? Um, do western sandpipers dive under and grab their food like ducks? Ooh, oh. good question. Do western do west sandpipers yes, dive under the water and catch catch their food like, like ducks, ducks or swans or geese do? Yeah, we've got some duck. Ski swan experts, experts in Alaska. Let's yeah. go at, talk to them. Okay. Well, no, they don't. Shorebirds are actually pretty specialized, and there's a lot of variety within shorebirds. You have some birds like the curlews with the long recurved bill, and they'll partition out in a certain kind of habitat where the water's a little bit deep, but they still don't dive. Ducks, d ducks and waterfowl, now they'll have a whole different feeding strategy. You know, you can have some ducks that feed on the surface and some ducks that dive. But shorebirds, they're all just feeding right at the tide line here. Pretty shallow water. They don't dive at all. Great. Thank you, Dan. Now, we've got a little more time for questions. So our next question is from where should we go? Can we, Mrs. Poppy, can we have a question from your class? What do they do for defense? Oh, Ooh. what do shorebirds do for dis defense? You know, I think our friends in Cordova Absolutely. have some good answers yeah. for that. Let's the, go there. The, the shorebirds, what the, the beautiful displays we're seeing as they're flying around and they're making these beautiful patterns in the sky, what they're doing is they're trying to look not like one shorebird, but one giant organism. And so it, it, it fools the hawks and eagles and other predators that are after them. And also those large numbers help, as they're on the ground, divert other predators from getting at them. So the, the safety in numbers is how they're doing it. Great. Well, we understand safety in numbers, that's for sure. Um, okay, we have another caller from Manassas, Virginia. Manassas, go ahead with your question. Um, I, I want to know if there are any endangered species of shorebirds in North America. Oh, that's a great question. The caller wants to know if there's any endangered shorebirds in North America. And we actually have uh, a, a few endangered shorebirds, and they include the piping plover, the snowy plover, um, and the bristle-thighed curlew, 
And then there's another number of species that are species of special concern. That means they're not endangered yet, but their numbers are declining. So we're concerned about them, and we're doing special studies on them to learn more. Okay. Well, it looks like we have another caller. And our next call is from Sterling Middle School in Michigan. Okay, Sterling, what's your question? So how many babies can shorebirds have? Ooh. How many babies can shorebirds have? You know, our Cordova friends uh, have an answer to that. Let's go back to Alaska. Sure. Shorebirds, you know, they're, they have a lot of diversity with them in terms of their size. But one thing all the species and all about the 80 species of shorebirds that we have are consistent in is they all lay about the same number of eggs. They'll lay four eggs per nest. And you can see that with just about all the species of shorebirds. Great. Good question. And we have another caller from Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach, go ahead. What's your question? Thank you. Your question? Go ahead, please. OK. Our caller, we've lost okay. our caller. So uh, Mrs. Poppy Class, do you have another uh, question for us? How old are shorebirds when they learn to fly? How old are shorebirds when they learn to fly? What a great question. That's a good one. I bet our Cordova friends can answer that. Let's go to yes. Dan and the crew. How about it, guys? Well, shorebirds jump out of the nest about three hours after they're hatched. And then, within about a month and a half, they're learning to fly. They follow their parents around on the Arctic tundra, and they have a lot of insects to eat to get ready for their migration. And then they take off. and. They know where to go. It's a magical thing. <laughs> okay. Right. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. You know, our next question is an email question. So, Ron, what's your question? This question comes from Jeff Catt, fifth grader from Standish Sterling Middle School. His question is, how many eggs do how many eggs does a shorebird have in one season? Okay. Oh. You know, I, I think the Cordova folks yeah. answered part of that. Yes. Let's just go back and, and see if they can add a little bit more to their answer. Okay. Sure, we can answer that question. Shorebirds normally lay four eggs, and most species will do that just once. But there are a couple species that lay several clutches, and a clutch is one group of, of eggs, usually four. I think there are some species where they continue to nest. The females may ha um, hatch out a clutch and then go on and find another mate. Thank you, Pam. We now have another call from Missoula, Montana. Missoula, go ahead. What's your question? What color are their eggs? Ooh, oh. what color are shorebird eggs? Oh, Let's ask good our Cordova question. friends. Yeah. Okay. Well, one of the things shorebirds are really good at is camouflaging their eggs. In fact, if you're doing surveys, a lot of people up in Alaska where we're looking for shorebird nests up in the tundra, you can't hardly see their nests sometimes. They're so good. So those eggs are kind of speckled and camouflaged, and you've got to get pretty close to see them. That's another thing they do to keep predators from eating them. Great. Great. Okay. I'm sorry, folks, but our last question mm. is going to be from Miss, Miss, uh, Mrs. Poppy's class. So what's our last question of today? When walking on the sand, why do they run away from the waves instead of flying away from them? Oh. When walking on the sand, why do they run away from the waves instead of just flying away? That's a great question. Let's ask that last question okay. back yeah. to Alaska. Well, those shorebirds are noodling around in the mud, and they're running back and forth because they want to get as many critters right along the water's edge. And they don't fly away because they want to keep on chowing down on those little invertebrates. <laughs>